Ladies and gentlemen, my fellow feathers in arms, welcome back to the Rabbit Holes That Quack episode number five. You're mostly related to today's documentary, Operation Varsity Blues, the College Admission Scandal podcast. I am one of your hosts, Brandon Jones, and joining me downstream on this adventure, the woman, the myth, a quack who will be the least culpable person on this podcast, Miss Nicole Matthews. Hello, listeners. And if you are just joining us well into the future or in near real time, welcome. This is a podcast where Nicole and I subject ourselves to a random documentary every week and let that be the springboard for a larger conversation about the issues therein. If you'd like to drop a particular documentary into the hat for us to choose from, we'll be choosing them from amongst our patrons at patreon.com slash Pandora's Quack, where you can also submit broader topics, comments, and questions for both this and our other sister podcast, such as The Movies That Quack, where co-hosts Wade Slicken and I put each other on the spot each week to ask each other Hollywood's most poignant and stupid questions about what we think will happen happen next, as well as The Conversations That Quack, where co-host Ephraim Garcia and I do a weekly deep dive into the issues facing the Black movie protagonist. If you enjoy what you hear tonight, help us keep it going by supporting us over at patreon.com slash Pandora's Quack and becoming a patron of any one of our tiers that start as low as $1, which includes early access to all of Pandora's Quack's podcast. But if that's not in the cards for you right now, that's more than okay. Feel free to share, rate, and review us on the free podcasting service of your choice and stick around for Pandora's Quack's other upcoming shows. And so... Without further ado, these are the rabbit holes that quack. Operation Varsity Blues, The College Admission Scandal is a documentary featuring reenactments that drive this documentary investigating the mastermind behind a scam to sneak the kids of rich and famous families into top U.S. universities. It was directed by Chris Smith, for whom listeners may know from his work on American movies, home movies, and the Yes Men, all three documentaries. It was written by John Carmen, who shares writing cred on a short film entitled Jean-Claude Van Damage. If that sounds familiar, uh, that got turned into one season of an Amazon uh, show. Uh, It was a little weird. The short, I remember being really funny. I was kind of excited about the the show, and the show ended up kind of being um, sort of like how SNL, like it'll be like a really funny skit, and then when they turn it into a movie, the idea doesn't really hold up to 90 minutes. That's kind of how this felt, but the short is really good. So if you can kind of uh, check that out, it's probably on YouTube or somewhere, somewhere. Check that out. Um, as of this recording, Operation Varsity Blues, the college admission scandal currently sits at an 88% critical Rotten Tomatoes rating with a 73% audience score. Listeners, last week we teased you with automation, but we made a last minute juke to the college admission scandal that most of you probably are vaguely familiar with. I'm sure there are multiple documentaries out there at this point, but tonight we are diving into this one. Nicole, you had the benefit of checking this out a bit closer to release. You let the juices marinate. You're far more plugged into the lives of celebrities than I am. Let's start with your impressions of the scandal itself. And if you can take us back, where were your thoughts about it at the time as you were kind of seeing this breaking news, Felicity Huffman, Laura Loffman, and just what is going on with this college admission scandal? Well, to take us back to when this first broke, I have to say it was highly entertaining and a very, very juicy story in Hollywood. I think that especially just given the scale of it, Um, And then also the particular celebrities involved. Not to say, let's be real, that Lori Loughlin and Felicity Huffman are like, you know, A-list per se. But I would say Felicity Huffman is like B plus, right? Um, So I definitely think like these are household names, right? For a number of different reasons. These women were definitely well known. Um, And I think, you know, ultimately something like this for a celebrity is just embarrassing right like I think there's kind of two kind of celebrities out there there's ones that you know are just reckless and are just prone to committing crime anyways Mm -hmm. and those are different kinds of crime um and then I think there's instances like this of just um you know stupidity and moments where I think your your kind of ego and your need to keep up a certain appearance gets the best of you right as opposed to um, you know, people with maybe truly bad intentions. Uh, so this was a pretty big one, I think, and definitely 
Did not surprise me, I think, in terms of the context of it. I think, again, the more shocking piece was just that celebrities would find themselves wrapped up in this. Um, but I think, you know, having gone to NYU, uh, for me, nothing about the scandal itself was particularly shocking. Yeah, it's interesting because I don't know if I really had strong feelings about it, but I was just, it was almost just sort of like a, a shrug and then I moved on. But I agree with you that the piece about celebrities that seems super odd to me is that, especially for like in the Lori Laughlin instance, I would have just assumed just looking at her on site and knowing that she had this big online following that she would have just started acting. Like I kind of like, I don't know what she would have gone to college for. And I remember even she kind of mentioned that it was almost more of something her parents wanted. But whenever I think about celebrities, when, unless you're an athlete where it's kind of part of the process, which is probably why they do that by design, where it's like you generally only get drafted off of a sort of college team and kind of a college experience. And there's sort of a tangible four years, ideally that you're honing your craft I just don't know why you would do it. So if anything, it almost just seemed puzzling that that would be a thing. Um, and then again, like similarly having gone to NYU, I remember when the Olsen twins were there, but they were in the film program, which again kind of like made me scratch my head because I was just like, you guys can just do this. Like you have the infrastructure, you have the money. I'm sure you have the connections. Like I don't get what what you're doing right now. Um, so yeah, it's kind of, it's it's, I understand the like, you're a lawyer, you're a finance person, there's kind of this, um, and they get into this a little bit in the documentary. There is, I can understand the like status symbol, if you will, but like from a celebrity standpoint, I just kind of, I would be confused by that. Like, I don't know why they would do that kind of thing. I mean, again, I think, you know, it's the reason I say that I was surprised is just because of the risk that they're taking yeah. of, of having such a high profile and doing something like that, right? But I think ultimately, as we'll get to, I'm not surprised that they had to go to those lengths just because something I think that, you know, we'll discuss tonight. Um, universities have just become extremely selective, right? And so I do think, you know, what a lot of this documentary explores, obviously, is um, the effects of that, right? Like, what does that really do when universities are only accepting so many people or certain types of people? Um, and clearly, we have now gotten to a point and an environment where even celebrities who, as you're saying, you know, shouldn't really have to be going to these lengths um, are. It's not a guarantee that their offspring is going to get in. Right. Um, and I do think, you know, again, as evidenced by some of the particulars of uh, Felicity Huffman and Lori Laughlin's daughter's situation, um, you know, these were girls that didn't have high chances on merit. Right. So I think to me that part, you know, was easily explained uh, for sure. I think it's, it kind of shows that in a in a weird way, they were sort of on an even playing field in knowing that their kid couldn't get in. Yeah, the uh, the comical disrespect from uh, I think it was their friend that basically was like, um, it was odd that one of them got into USC. It was completely, you know almost impossible that her sister got in the USC. And then I thought even the point where a college counselor's like, yeah, you seem kind of dumb for that to happen. Let me, let me, let me just double check that. Just again, just <laughs> weird that like that's, that was the thing that happened. But, um, so you hear about the scandal and of course, uh, you see that there's a documentary being made. What were your like expectations for the documentary or really to rephrase, what were you expecting to learn from the scandal that wasn't really in, you know, the public eye already sort of in the media, any opinions you were thinking were going to be changed kind of both for, for yourself or maybe some of the conversations that you would have with like friends, family and such, like what is, what are you getting from a documentary? Unlike something like the fire festival where we kind of saw that meltdown in real time. And then I think when we watched both of those documentaries, it was almost just kind of like, yeah, this is kind of what I thought happened. And it's like, just f everything seemed about the fire Festival just like seemed to be a bad idea. And it was really only some of the anecdotes that were kind of really interesting. They were kind of buried in the documentary, but looking at this, was there anything that you were kind of expecting to actually get that, that you hadn't seen already? I think going in, um, cause I didn't really like watch the trailers too much, but I think like Going in, I expected it to focus mostly on kind of everyone that was involved, right? Like everyone that ended up getting prosecuted. Um, so I was not expecting the reenactments. I think that was a really necessary 
way of telling this particular story. Um, I actually was happy for those. I will say that uh, historically, with a lot of documentaries, I really usually don't prefer reenactments because I don't think that they are done very well a lot of times. Um, I think they can be a little bit awkward. The staging sometimes I think can kind of take you out of the the actual documentary. Um, but I do think this was one of the rare ones where for me it, it did work um, and it, it helped, I think, sort of illustrate um, just really how insane this story is, right? <laughs> I think kind of watching these like conversations that he was having, um, you know, with his, with some of these parents, uh, it would have been hard, I think, if they were just having a narrator uh, to kind of give us that. Um, so I was expecting kind of that to be the key focus. I think what I wasn't expecting was just, you know, how much they would also work to kind of paint a picture for the audience um, around why we got to a point where something like this can even be possible, right? Um, and I think that was the part that was probably the more interesting side of the story um, is just sort of where we currently are as it relates to university admissions, um, why this guy was able to even find this niche to like exploit essentially. Um, I think that to me was the part that wasn't expecting, but was also happy was included because it really, I think helped paint a broader uh, picture for people. Yeah. Um, I did think, I assumed it was going to be more of a, you know, this is what the media thought, this is what the talking heads thought, um, almost how some of the ones that we've uh, done on this podcast where it's more of a, we're getting a composite based off of, you know, clips and all this kind of stuff. I do think, I agree with you, the reenactments did a lot of legroom, and I think casting Matt Modine, Modine I think is what his name is, um, to do that uh, was really, really well done um, because I think it just... I think it kind of lent a uh, it, it 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 really kind of allowed you to kind of see almost just how nonchalant all of it was, mm -hmm. and just like this guy where it was like you know because the documentary uh, for listeners who haven't seen it it just does kind of set up where it's like most of the conversations and dialogue are from well, the wiretaps, and so when you're kind of seeing some of these conversations and it's just comical that. You have this guy who's just on the phone being like, oh, yeah, you can just, you know, give me a couple, you know, $100,000 or a million dollars. And then what I'll do is just like go take a picture, a few pictures of him, of your kid, and I'll Photoshop it because I've got to connect with like the water pole. And it's like so just like, like, oh, yeah, we're just going to go grab a beer and oh, can you get my kid into like USC? Yeah, I'll do that. That's fine. That's fine. We can, we can do that on the way. It's just like, it was just like a weird matter of fact thing. And like hearing story after story and seeing context after context, that I think was just really fascinating. And I'm glad that they did that um, in the context of the reenactments, because I think if you would have just heard those, it wouldn't have quite kind of hit home, like how almost absurd all of this was, but it was just a really nice touch to uh, kind of conveying what the scandal was and just how it just sort of blew up, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I definitely agree with you about conveying the absurdity. I think the other reason it was really necessary is it also conveyed the various degrees of guiltiness of everyone that was involved. Yeah. Right. I think that obviously, you know, there were people that very clearly knew what were going on and were leaning into it. I think there were some parents that were obviously much more cautious in the way that they talked to him, but they still kind of knew what was going on. And then I think there was also obviously some of his victims, you know, um, people and university administrators, um, some of the coaches of these teams. You know, I'm thinking of the one gentleman in particular um, that they, they, you know, focus on quite a bit. I felt very bad for him. You know, he kind of got wrapped up in something that was probably much larger than he realized. Um, and I think that, you know, having those reenactments allowed you to kind of make different assumptions, I think, about everyone's individual involvement and level of awareness and then kind of establish an opinion around, you know, how guilty you thought they might be um, or how malicious the intent was going in, right? So I think that was really useful for, for that reason as well. Yeah. So what did you then think about the documentary as a film? Did it seem fair to the schools that were kind of mentioned, uh, to the parents, to the kids? Did it seem like, you know, it was biased in the, in the instance that it was sort of an indictment with, um, you know, the morals, if you will, of sort of the parents? I think Singer was pretty 
he seemed accurately portrayed based on the interviews that we got, but just like everything else, do you think that some of these parents or these people that, you know, obviously were, um, you know, their names and faces and what they did, uh, well documented in the media, but do you think that they were, um, just how do you think this, this came off together? Was it like preaching or was it like a good sort of approach to, I know nothing about the scandal, watch this documentary? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think like taking kind of, you know, looking at the celebrities first, right? I actually thought it was a fair portrayal, being that so much of it was things they were actually, I guess, in at least Lori Laughlin's case, able to use the family's own footage um, to help paint that story, right? Uh, I'm sure that wasn't great for them. I'm sure she wishes that some of those things weren't as easily accessible, um, some of the videos that her daughter had shot uh, around that time period. Um, but I I think being, that being said, I, I still thought it was kind of fair in terms of how it portrayed them and, and their intent. And I think you could kind of get insight into probably where she was at mentally, um, in making a decision like that in the first place. Um, but that being said, it's still, you know, to a lot of your earlier points, very troubling and, and hard to understand that someone with that amount of wealth and status, uh, would sort of risk everything in that way. Um, I think, you know, going back to one of my earlier points, for me, the thing that I really enjoyed the most about the documentary, um, you know, was sort of the the evaluation of universities in the U.S., right? And this system that we've created and kind of fed and, you know, I think that people continue to kind of struggle with for a number of reasons. Um, that part to me was the part I enjoyed the most. Uh and I definitely think it was biased for sure, but it's a bias that I tend to agree with. <laughs> um, I think this is, you know, again, having gone to NYU and kind of gone through that experience of just knowing how difficult um, that can be for, I think, a kid who's like trying to do something like that. Uh, and then also knowing that in the years since then, it's only become even more difficult to get into schools like that. I don't really think that, you know, as a country anymore, our university system is doing a service to students. Uh, I think it's sort of, it's actually kind of strange and bizarre to me um, that we have become like more selective, I think, in the process and sort of created this type of environment. Um, when you think about the fact that the purpose of a university is is to educate, right? Uh, and so essentially we've designed a system in which we are denying education on a massive scale. Yeah, I'd be curious to see those stats, mostly because of that guy who uh, I forgot sort of what his what his title or credentials were, but the the black guy who was sort of um, doing interviews and kind of doing um, I think he might have been a journalist actually, but it was cool that he was like, it's not so much that it's hard to get into school, it's that you have people who are flooding the same twenty schools, and then he kind of had like you know some of the outlines of just like why that was, and he was like even these scandals will make them even seem more sort of selective or more elite and it is kind of one of those things where like i remember um because i know you and i we've talked a lot uh for years about sort of like how we reflect back on college and i kind of think for me it was sort of useless kind of thing not the education if you will but sort of call it the prestige of like where you go and then how much thing you know debt you may carry and all that kind of stuff and i think for you um you kind of look at it as sort of like more necessary and so like the more that i kind of interact with like people now having much much distance kind of away from college and i'll talk to people and i'm like oh did you use you what you went to school for and really like the obvious stuff obviously like sort of finance and for medical and for legal there's just sort of like a one-to-one yes like absolutely like there's no sort of question there and i think for everyone else it was almost kind of like yeah i went and i wanted to be an ex and then i kind of changed it last whatever or i just kind of did this thing quit and taught myself how to do this other thing and now i'm sort of really good at this and so it's like then you juxtapose that to what the documentary really tries to portray is just that like a lot of this seems to be motivated by this status symbol type of thing i think that same guy was like yeah it's kind of this thing where you go well i never got into harvard so if it's if my kid can get into harvard it's almost like my way of vicariously living through them um that i'm able to do that which is kind of interesting but i think what may shock you and some of our listeners um i actually even by the end of this didn't actually care that much about what they did it was like one of the things that i've always wondered about 
is that will any of these kids actually like amount to anything? Like it's kind of one of those things where like, um, I think I've told you like, you know, you and I have had conversation with this. I've definitely had it with a few other friends where it's like, there's, you know, there's always going to be wealthy people. And it's like, I don't, I'm not kind of beating the drum that some people are about like, oh, the wealthy are too wealthy and blah, blah, blah. blah. I, I just don't really care. Like, it's kind of like, yep, you won the genetic lottery. You were born into this family and you lived in this neighborhood. Cool. I think the thing that like bothers me is when you have these people who have all these resources and opportunities and such, and they sort of squander it. They kind of don't really do anything with it. And it's not like you have to like, you know, you're not born into privilege to cure cancer. That's not what I'm talking about. It's just more of like, oh, okay, like I wanted to be a blah, 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 blah. So I went and did it kind of thing. Like not these stories of people who had to like, you know, scrounge together pennies to go to an acting class or scrounge together pennies or, you know, take out loan, loan, loan to go, you know, be an engineer or anything like that. So it's kind of just one of those things where like, will any of these kids that got in over the 20 years that Singer was doing this just end up doing anything? Like, it's like, will they have used this degree to go into something? Will it have mattered? And it's like, I don't know that we'll know that for sure. And I guess no one will, because at least with regards to the documentary, it seemed like they didn't really intend to go back that far. It was really just kind of about the people that, um, I guess we're kind of in the last two or three years, but granted with over i think the documentary says there's over 50 people that they were looking into i guess they'll come for everyone at some point um because the paper trail seemed very dubious at best even though everyone's this seems shady radar was going off uh they went through with it anyway uh which is funny because i can just imagine being on the phone with him being like yeah this sounds like a bribe and i would have liked to have heard like hear, like hear a singer like tap dance around that to be like well it's not really a bribe because blah blah blah, blah but it's just yeah, it's a, it's a, it's interesting. That's, that's kind of where I'm like, where I was at by, by the, which surprised me. Like, I was just like, well, is this going to matter for any of these kids? Cause it didn't, I don't, I don't know. I mean, you may know, but I don't think that cause this wasn't in the documentary per se. I don't think any of these kids to my knowledge were kicked out of school. I know some of them left cause like they were found out obviously. And then it was just kind of like untenable, but to my knowledge, it was kind of like the universities didn't punish them because i think for the most part those kids just didn't know like the vast majority of them were just completely in the dark about all this yeah i mean i think i have a slightly different take on that and that i didn't get the sense that any of these parents expectation was necessarily what it would lead to i think it again is more of a status thing and i think like Olivia Jade was a perfect example of that. And I really appreciated that they touched on that of just the irony of the fact that she was already successful yeah. being an influencer um, and kind of doing her makeup business. And I think that, she, you know, it just kind of shows like, to your point, like these kids don't need this. She would have already had a business probably that she was still running right now. Um, I mean, I think she still does truthfully. I just think this scandal like set her back a little bit. Um, but I read the parents' motivation again, more as status, you know, like, I don't think that they were expecting USC to lead to something specific. I think it was just being able to go around and tell, you know, the media, their family, their friends, oh, my daughters are going to USC, right? And I think that's sort of like the sickness that is pervasive in this system right now. Um, I think, you know, as evidence, even in the beginning by all of those clips of, you know, um, stu young students finding out whether or not they've, you know, gotten into their dream schools, um, it, it's purely about status now, right? And I think that's kind of, you know, again, going to the, the point you made about the gentleman saying that, you know, you can get into any university. Yes, that's true. But the problem is, is that people don't want to get into any university. They want to get into a good university. And there are very few of those, or at least very few that society has deemed are good. Yeah, it would be fascinating if, um, and I don't know how you would do this, because probably even this unto itself would probably be illegal, but it would be interesting to send someone you know, those, those people who are like in their late twenties, early thirties that still look like they could probably be in their like early twenties and to just send someone almost like through like a semester just to get a sense of like, does this school like seem worth the cost? Does the education seem particularly like fat? Like, because I get like, you know, there's sort of uh it's, it's, I get the perceived value of the the insignia on the diploma like i understand that but i wonder now the way things are going the way that sort of the economy is going the way that things are kind of 
turning more into not so much sort of a self-driven kind of economy, economy, but just sort of this less rat race mentality, I guess is probably the best way to sort of phrase it. Um, will these universities continue to have that power over high schoolers and power over parents and just power in general to kind of make people sort of thirst for them. You know, there's sort of the term that you had sent me and I kind of talked with a few other folks about, you know, the geriatric, geriatric millennial that came out. But really what, to me, what that said was that there's a clear bifurcation now um, where it's like that small segment of that transitional generation who remembers the old ways, but is sort of adapted to the new ways and like it was interesting to see some of these kids obviously the the videos that you were talking about in the beginning where they were like really devastated by not getting in and and such and i think i remember um weren't the sats like 1200 or 1400 i remember when they went to 1600 i want to say it was like 1400 you might have always been 1400 to you but i remember when they changed um because i think, I I think had... it was out of six i remember it being out of 1600 and yeah. then when it changed it moved like above 2000 i think it went to like 2400 but that was after my time Got the it. sats i took i'm pretty sure were out of 1600 the sats in my day were five um yeah it's a. Uh, I just I, it's one of those things where like i do wonder it's sort of like this this cycle the stuff that we talk about all the time about like the the psychology of of influence um almost like the fake famous stuff where it's like if you keep trying to convince kids that this is important then i guess at some point they just kind of think it's important and although i would say higher education as a concept is necessary i do think that the college application of that definitely needs to be re-examined um i think i saw biden something the other day i didn't see the the source for it so it may, may totally be someone over exaggerating but i think they were saying that he said that perhaps like schooling should actually be 16 years instead of 12 and obviously people lost their minds but i remember thinking about that even with like college when i went um being like i wish undergrad were six years because and the programs that i went through they were a little bit sort of hands-on. I felt like I didn't really get a grasp of what I was doing until the end of the semester. And then you sort of change over and it's not important anymore. Um, but that's what grad school is. And that's what a uh, extra commas added to your uh, student owner supposed to be for. Yeah, I mean, I think another issue is that like at the end of the day too, I think it should start later. I think a large part of the problem with university and with people feeling like they don't get anything out of it is that you are essentially expecting 18 year olds to decide a major that is then going to lead to a specific career at 18. And we know that what the human brain isn't fully formed till the age of 25. Um, I think that to me is probably the most bizarre part of the system. Um, so instead of six years, why doesn't it start at, at 20 or 21 or 22, right? Like, why don't we restructure what that path looks like so that people actually come out of that experience having known going into it, this is truly something that they want to do. And the reality is, look, is like, I, I don't know what the latest stat on that is, but I, I'm pretty sure it's about like the average person will have like 10 to 12 different jobs in their lifetime. So it's not to say that we just aren't in a different environment where people's career is going to change, but I do think it is very problematic that 17 and 18 year olds are being asked to pick a major um, that is supposed to lead to a job. I think that's a very strange concept. Yeah, the only counter I would have to that is less about the schools and more about um like the thing I always used to tell people is I was like when you graduate college, if you started a job and your boss was like, I need you to read this 2000 page document and give me like a 300 page report. You could do it. Like that's kind of just the way your brain's wired. And like the further distance you get away from call it college or call it your early twenties or, you know, some sort of X factor, the more life and experience you have you kind of just start seeing those tasks as being unnecessary and so it's like this like inability then it's like almost like you know you and i in our field the deeper we go no one actually cares about the context or the details anymore they just want like two or three slides with as few words and visuals on them whereas like people you and i knew people who wrote research papers that could be you know stand up to you know 
legal law reviews and all this kind of stuff. And so it's interesting because it's like, I think that may be part of it. Um, and one of the things that I always said kind of from, from, you know, the quarter life crisis era, uh, is I just feel like that age group is wildly underutilized because you have that ability just almost inherently in you. And then their first jobs, depending on what it is, is just sort of like very busy work, kind of what the offload from the more senior folks getting coffee, blah, blah, blah. Um, question for you with some of that stuff like does it you mentioned earlier how is this stuff possible does that seem anything about kind of in the documentary about this being possible did that seem like I think the piece of this that was interesting to me is what was actually constituting as quote-unquote illegal because if donating 10, 15, 20 million dollars to a university gets, you know, Matthews Hall built and then your kid sort of gets, you know, uh, this very gray area of like favorability. My sort of my gut would tell me that it's like, oh, if you're a few, a few points shy, cool. But if you're a moron, they're going to be like, hey, thanks for the donation. But like, really? sort of thing like that's kind of like was my sense kind of of it like more so than just sort of a guarantee but like that feels like a known thing so then yes there's deception involved very much deception involved of photoshopping you know a kid in a pool and saying that he's on this you know polo team and all this kind of stuff and then like getting them into the university but then like as it was explained it was really just to kind of get them in the door because it's not like they're taking the athletic spot I get that someone who may have gotten in on merit sort of gets bumped. But like, again, like that's kind of why I, I was saying like, I don't know that like I care, I guess that much about it. But again, kind of just bring it back to the question. Like the fact that this is possible, does that surprise you? Was that like weird to you? Was that kind of one of those things where you were like also kind of questioning like, is this legal? Cause it wasn't like he was ever really directly. I mean, I guess he was, there were some people who was definitely paying like, I think that woman was like 20,000 a month or something like that. But just like, the idea that this is possible. I mean, no, it definitely struck me as very illegal. Yeah. Like, <laughs> There's so much of what he did that was like so obviously illegal. Because the guy that you're talking about that got roped into it that was on camera the most, like the fact that they got him, like even his lawyer was like, yeah, that doesn't sound good. But like, would a jury believe that he was just kind of like, yeah, man, that's fine. That's fine. Because like I got from him the entire time that like, um, if those listeners kind of remember the sailing uh, coach, I got from him the entire time that he was just like, oh, you actually care about sailing? All right, yeah, like, thanks for donating. Like, that's really cool. Yeah, I'll take a look. Like, that's cool. Like, that's the least I can do. And like, in a favor sense, like, I don't think in any point in his mind was he like, oh, hey, like, give me my money so that like we can do this deal unlike some of his other sort of colleagues that were like very much like hey this is the deal or hey they're getting close to us hey like someone sniffing around like blah blah blah, blah. um which is why yeah, again, for sure. i mean that's that's who i was referring to when i yeah. said one of his victims yeah. I, I view that guy as one of his victims for sure because i i think that you know to your point like i think he was he was a victim of him, but again, he was also a victim of the system because to your point, it is legal to just give donations and have and they explain that, yeah. right? Like that is a regular part of recruitment. Um, it's a regular part of the program. So I think that, you know, with that guy in particular, I, I did feel for him because he thought he was just sort of doing what is expected, which is that you're supposed to bring money into the university, right? Yeah. Um, and I think that's, again, like it points at just the larger issue here of like, so it's actually funny, but, um, you know, I think I've mentioned this guy to you now a couple of times, uh, Scott Galloway, um, everyone should check him out. He's interesting. He has a podcast called it's like professor G or something like that. Um, he's actually a professor at NYU. Um, but he's, you know, he's very critical of the university system. And I think one thing he says that, that really has been resonating with me, because he says this like quite vocally, um, you know, these and it, it's still ironic him saying it as an NYU professor, but that, you know, these universities take in millions and millions of dollars and they still get to claim nonprofit status. Yeah. 
Right. I mean, and it's that to me is just what's bonkers and not only claim nonprofit status, but then also have an environment like they did at Stanford where, you know, coaches and professors are expected to bring in additional money for the university. Right. And so when you think about it in that light, like these aren't nonprofits, these are businesses. This is about revenue. Right. This is about the bottom line. And I think that that is the other part that for me has just started to become uncomfortable about all of it, right? It's like, really, these are for-profit institutions because they operate that way in terms of their business tactics, their strategies, the way they approach their admissions. Um, you know, and I think the status thing is a really big part of their ability to keep pulling in that amount of money, right? Because not only does it enable them to keep raising the tuition to crazy rates, which they do, you know, whatever you and I paid to go to NYU is probably triple that now, right? We know that for sure. Um, but then they also, through, you know, again, difficult admissions, get to create an environment where people make donations in order to have a better shot at getting admitted. So I think, like, from all sides, to me, it's just starting to read as kind of like, why is our educational system so based on money? Yeah, it would be interesting to... Uh... I really miss, and I uh, hope it comes back, even though it's, it's kind of uh, something being resurrected on Netflix, um, extremely rare, but the Patriot Act, um, the show that, I don't know that you ever watched um, any episodes that you may have watched a couple with me, but what I, I think Hassan Minash actually had an episode about, um, definitely about student loans, if I'm remembering correctly. And it is one of those things where you are puzzled about why there's so much money involved because you understand the like real estate and all that kind of stuff but that you know should top out at a certain point because it's not like they're kind of increasing the capacity really kind of like tenfold or whatever and then it's like the more that you kind of go into it it's like okay so then are the dorms kind of super prestigious are they uh, is this better? Is this actually better? Are they attracting better like teachers? Are they paying these teachers? Like it was just like, you almost don't see it where this money is sort of allegedly going. And I think that's kind of the the problem with it. Like I think that, you know, people ended up paying 200 grand for like their education. And then, you know, how many tens of thousands of students, you know, per revolution, uh, just, you know, per grade, per uh, freshman, per sophomore year. Um, and it's like, I don't know like where that money is supposed to be going in a tangible way. And like, that's not something that's really been addressed as much as, you know, um, there've been articles that have been passed around. I think you may have even sent me one and, um, one of that was kind of being shared around with some of my folks was a lot of people, workers are just basically straight up quitting. Like they're being told, Hey, we're going back to the office in July. We're being going back to the office in August. Uh, you know, prepare yourself. And people are just like, nah, I'm good. And they're just like quitting. And so like, what happened to these kids that basically were told, you know, in some lower universities, stay home. Like, it's like, you're just, you know, you're getting this tens of thousands of education the same way that someone can just take an online university for a few hundred bucks. And like that in the same way that the pandemic will revolutionize remote working and how teams are built and how companies are founded and how like office real estate and just sort of dynamics, all of that will change. I don't think we've seen anything, to my knowledge at least, for people taking a, like, a closer look at what the past year has done for school. Obviously, all the stuff about you know K-12 through 12 is kind of blowing up, uh, becoming very political. But just like from that college experience, because I do think obviously paying 60 grand a year to be on site, you know, no one really was paying that close attention to it. You know, for you and I being in New York City and New York is an expensive city, you kind of were like, this is really expensive and probably like far more the margins here probably far greater than they need to be but you get it but then it's like if we were in school now and you were back in california and now i was back in atlanta and we were just glued to our desk for an entire year and then i think i do remember at the beginning of the pandemic people talking about universities weren't like prorating anything like they weren't actually like refunding anything they weren't like saying like this and this and this what does that do then to that graduating class, what does that do to people who, like, we might even see, similar to, uh, I don't know if you ever saw the, um, how Khan Academy basically kind of came up, and it was very similar, where he was like, you know, I saw an opportunity where people were kind of doing things this way, and I thought that we could do it another way, yada, yada, and now he's, like, extremely successful, and I think he blew up over the pandemic, but it's like, I could very much see 
someone or a group or whatever basically creating a quote unquote Ivy League university that's like almost entirely remote with the exception of like you should probably come to like this thing or like you should probably come to this thing or you should probably come to this thing and then we'll do an in-person graduation sort of thing. And that being as prestigious as having spent all that money and then being on a campus that's almost seemingly to fund the football team or to fund this or to fund this or to fund this and kind of ignore the rest of the university, which is interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I am I am curious. I think that some of the things with the, <clears throat> the workforce are inevitable at this point, and I think there is no turning back in terms of, like, flexibility and, and increased op optionality um, for employees. But I do think that the verdict is still out on universities. And I think, you know, you, you mentioned it, like, with Fake Famous, right? So much of, you know, the currency in the world now is, like, your social status. So I think, you know, we're going to have to kind of see when the dust settles, you know, will these universities be able to maintain, you know, their slice of that social status pie, right? Um, is that something that people will still regard uh, in a certain way? And if they do, I think then this continues on for a few other years um, because I still think people are going to continue to look for those signposts, um, you know, for their children of like, oh, they went to Harvard, they went to Yale, they went to whatever. Um, my hope is that it does change um, because I do think there's a lot of need for improvement. Um, and also that... This doesn't have to be the only way. Um, that's another thing that um, Galloway talks about a lot as well, is just sort of like, it's not even about fixing the university system. I think his his view on it is it's irreparably broken. Um, I Something he advocates for that I do really agree with is that we, we need to just see more like trade programs. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we need to see more just companies creating pass for kids coming from high school straight into the work world. Um, I do think Google is already doing this and there are some other large companies that have programs like this, but I do really believe that that's going to be the future. Um, and, you know, and another interesting reason that he cites for that is, you know, it, if you look at the numbers, women are going to college at increasingly higher rates than men. Um, and so another reason that I think he advocates for this is really to help out men who are struggling right now from an educational perspective, from a job opportunity perspective. Um, and so I think this is an important thing as well, just to sort of balance out what we are seeing in terms of university attendance and, you know, paths towards livelihood really for both men and women. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely like an interesting idea, um, especially for these companies that, um, have multi-disciplines like a Google and Amazon, um, and probably really a handful of others, especially some international companies, to just say, hey, high schooler, uh, you could spend four years doing, you know, blah, 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 and then compete, or you could essentially make this like your part-time gig uh, for like sort of an internship, kind of come in, learn the trade, still kind of live your life, still have that sort of quote-unquote college experience, but at least you're kind of already in the door, kind of already on the path. And if they can kind of structure it in such a way where it's like you can actually, there's clear mobility um, or upper mobility, um, both financially and sort of perhaps, you know, even from sort of the title sort of standpoint, that seems to make the most sense. That's almost like what I was getting at earlier about, I just don't know what college means outside of, again, the sort of like legal, the medical uh, sort of fields where it's like, I mean, even now, um, I was talking to a friend today where, um, kind of a recruiter was talking about this, like, uh, I think it's like CCAT test. And it's just like, it's fascinating to me that how much AI and machine learning is getting involved with, you know, scanning your resume for keywords and then scanning your LinkedIn for keywords. And then kind of like what we talked about with the fake famous, probably likely looking at your social media and looking at all these things and sort of making a composite guess, kind of an educated guess about would you be a good employee? Um, and all of that sort of, to your point again, about like you're 18, 17 years old and the path that might be very difficult to get off of starts with really junior year and like some of these people who are taking 
you know, AP courses and like trying to do all these sort of athletics and all this kind of stuff and then figuring out how much debt am I going to kind of carry with me? Will I be able to get a job out of all this? And so I get, again, kind of like, it's not like any of those parents were kind of like having that conversation. Really, that's not even kind of, you know, what this is or kind of what the money. And we didn't get any interviews really from the parents. I think that would have been really fascinating. I feel like, you know, probably the way that the one parent, uh, the gray hair, kind of the white guy that was like, this will be a huge embarrassment if this gets out sort of thing. Like, obviously, they don't want to kind of then be in the documentary and kind of say, well, we kind of thought, blah, 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 and then be asked directly, didn't this seem like a bribe to you sort of thing? I'm sure they legally, that just would have been a terrible idea. Uh, but it would have been- I'm sure all these people just want to forget this and move on, for yeah. sure. <laughs> but I definitely would have wanted to hear from like a parent. Because it's like, I mean, like I get, there's obviously the status symbol and it's like, that's kind of its own thing. There's the peer pressure, like again, its own thing. Like I get it. But again, like the one, well, not even her. I was about to say the woman with like the daughters where the, the older daughter was just like, whatever about it. Just don't tell the younger one. And the younger one was like, she's just like, oh, I just don't think she's smart enough or she doesn't, you know, she's her scores or whatever. It's just, it's kind of just like one of those things where just like, I just trying to wrap my mind around that, around the aspect of being more concerned about where they go um, versus like, is this something that will be meaningful to you? And that's, you know, again, like an adult who's lived through plenty of corporate life that one would rather forget, but just like thinking about like, hey, is this something that you want to do? Is this like cool for you? Okay, great. Like, let's find you a school that like does that, that you can kind of do whatever as opposed to being like, all right, cool. Like, where are you going? Okay, we're going to shove you into Harvard. We're going to shove you in the Stanford. And then unbeknownst to that kid being like, oh, hey, I'm also going to use my influence with this former basketball coach who, uh, well, let's talk about that. Just how he just integrates into these sort of rich communities to then slide people through these doors, which is just amusing. Yeah, I mean, I, I suspect, like, in the case of Lori Laughlin, it's also just a case of, like, different ways of, again, looking at the paths towards a livelihood, right? Like, I think even though she's an actress, you know, maybe for her, looking at her daughter, she just doesn't want her to be an influencer, right? Like, just doesn't feel like that is a legitimate form of earning a living, right? Or wants her to do something more serious, you know? Like, I, I, I don't know. I think, you know, we can only, like, speculate. Um, you know, but I think to some of your earlier points, the question I'm most curious about is how much of what kids learn in school realistically now does align with a career anyways, right? Like, I think there's that question of like, do you choose the right thing? Do you get anything of it? But I think like the macro question here really is like, and even to the point of like, should there be trade schools? It's just like, does the university system match our current job force, right? Like how many disciplines that exist now are actually something that you can map a college degree to. Like, I would love to know what the answer to that is. And yeah. I could be wrong, right? Like, I, like maybe just because it's been so long since I've been in university, majors have evolved. But I feel like I still hear kids saying the same majors, like acting, fine arts, film, you know, communications, marketing, you know. And it's I just would be curious to know, like, even for things that have a clear career path like are those majors actually structured in a way where you can lead into that now um you know obviously for things like doctors and lawyers i think there will always be a need uh for a formal education for that right because it's just like there are certain things you need to know how to do um but i think yeah that would be something like i wonder if anyone has done that exercise to actually say like this major does actually tie to a job in the workforce well, it's even to go a step further and it's like, are there people who, because I knew a couple of people who were, you know, obviously like pre-med and like pre-law and all that kind of stuff, but it's like, even to go a step further, are these people who are, these kids, are they taking courses or are they doing things? Like there's this sort of um, cliched example that you hear in movies and stuff all the time, which I uh, presume is also real, but it's like people being like, oh yeah, I'm in political science. You go, oh, what do you want to do with that? And they're like, oh, well, you know, I have to take political science and then I have to take some criminology and some of these courses because I'm going to try to, you know, go into law for a little bit because I want to then eventually like, you know, be a politician and then eventually like make a run for the presidency. And they've kind of got this like 30 year 
plan that's really contingent on no missed stuff and no time off and no sort of like slacking and all this kind of stuff. And I wonder, you see that pressure uh, hinted at this, this, this documentary uh, is very much focused on the parents and sort of singer and sort of just the adults that quote unquote should have known better more so than the kids. The kids are almost just sort of in the background or talked about, but I would be curious to see kind of if kids today that are in college or even enjoying college, like they're obviously you kind of see this stuff on the news about all the spring break uh, kind of shenanigans and all that kind of stuff. But I just always presume those to still be party schools. But when like you start talking about these higher end universities and some of these, um, you know, people who are trying to just be the cream of the crop, you know, that they've been doing since they were, you know, young and the pressure from their parents and all this kind of stuff is that to your point, where are they going? Like, what are they actually trying to do with that? Is that something that even in their minds as kids that they're like, this is going to be the decisive factor when I'm sitting there in a job interview four years from now, five years from now, six years from now, that they'll look back at this and this will get me that good job sort of thing. Um, Because that was definitely not in my mind. And I don't think any of most of the people that were sort of my peers in college, um, across the, the, the schools, it was just kind of like, cool, we got in. And then like, that was it. Like, that was kind of like, we made it across the finish line. And now I just wonder if kids are thinking like, call like getting into colleges in the finish line, finishing colleges at the finish line. If there's just like more stress that's still kind of pushed on them for this is still just yet one more, we've got two more chapters to go before we can be quote unquote complete or fulfilled or feel like this was all worth it. I mean, I do think that you you briefly touched on something that we are glossing over in this conversation right now, which is the fact that college also does provide a social environment that is very attractive to college age students, right? It is a safe space in a way. And I think that's also a contract that, you know, parents are comfortable with, right? It is a safe way to send your 17 or 18 year old out into the world um, and feel like you know, there's going to be maybe some kind of net there for them. Right. And I think that maybe when it comes to like their majors or, you know, likelihood of getting a job after students might have a more negative outlook, but I do still think there's a lot of young people right now that want to go to college for the experience of being at college. Right. I, I think that's something we haven't really dug into here, which is that, you know, those four years, I mean, even for myself, when I reflect back on my four years at NYU, most of my memories are not in class, you know, like that's just the reality of it. They're in the dorm or the cafeteria or going out at night or on the weekends, you know? Um, And so I do think there's, there's value in that a hundred percent. And I think that's probably why in some form, the system will always continue to exist. Um, but I think, again, the larger question is, is, is that offering enough value to command what students are paying for it? Yeah. And then even to bring it back to the documentary, is it worth the exposure to your point about ruining everything? Like I presume, I, I would guess of these folks, some people were, uh, we'll call it ruined, but like ruined only in so much as like, you know, they were sort of frowned upon by the community. People whispered behind closed doors, blah, 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 such and such. I don't really think this blew up in anyone's face for, for too much of a degree, especially because, uh, when you're that wealthy and you lawyer up, um, there's really not much that's going to happen to you. I think Felicity, what she did, they said that she served like 14 days. Lori Laughlin, I think, I don't know how much of 60 days that she served. I feel like. I think she only was there for like a month, I want to say. Yeah. Felicity, Felicity had the right idea, okay? See, sorry, I have to tangent here for a second just so I don't forget to say this later. Yeah. But that was another interesting thing for me from a celebrity perspective was when you actually get caught still having two different responses to it, right? Felicity Huffman was, in my mind personally, this is my opinion. Yeah. That was the right response. She took accountability right away, got her sentence, did her sentence, and was done. Lori Laughlin and her husband drug their feet. They were trying to fight it for quite some time. And that was the interesting thing from a celebrity news perspective, was that this story didn't end 
when it was just broke. This went on for months yeah. in terms of getting new updates of how they were actually trying to avoid jail time or avoid being prosecuted. And I thought that was really fascinating and a very interesting distinction that even once being found out, one of them still thought, I'm going to find a way out of this. That, to me, just shows, I think, the boldness of Lori Laughlin compared to Felicity Huffman. And I will say, it made me feel less judgmental of Felicity Huffman and more of, like, judgmental of Lori Laughlin, truthfully. I was a little bit like, okay, wow, like, you guys couldn't even take your penance, like, once everyone knew what you had done. Yeah, I definitely... uh it's funny to think about how um, I remember uh, Michael Rosenbaum has a, a great podcast um, inside of you. I think that's what it's called. And he had Bob Saget on there. I only saw like the, this specific clip, uh, not the whole show, but I remember he asked Bob Saget about it. And like, he was just like, Oh, you know, like just very genuine answer. Cause obviously they can work with her and like when everyone was young and kind of like coming up and which was like, you know, it's a really sad thing that like, I think I'm gonna, if, if I'm remembering this correctly, I think he was just more like, I'm sad that this is something they're going through, not really addressing whether or not, you know, the morality of it or was this the right thing to do or wrong thing to do. And it is interesting because they said, it's like, I look at this and I agree with you with, with Felicity Huffman sort of instance, because even when I remember the imagery that's in my head of, of her walking with William H. Macy, it was kind of like a, oh, wow, like, it's like maybe we understood the risk, but like maybe they were doing it for reasons. I know nothing about their daughter, so I might be completely, you know, no, this might be completely contradictory to like what you what you know uh, to be true. But it's just like it felt like not he hearing or reading anything that what they were saying. Like I didn't see the, you know, her saying any of that. It felt like it was like oh, we're trying to actually do this for a kid. Like it wasn't like it didn't feel like a peer pressure thing. It was like it felt like a, and that's just sort of again like the public persona that I have of those two of them. I might be completely wrong about that, but like conversely, again, I'm just kind of a good contrast. When you look at Lori Laughlin and then like her husband, it just kind of did seem that it was like, oh yeah, and then like that's something that we can just do, not really thinking about it in terms of the legality of it or this or that or the other. It was just like yeah, like our daughter should go to school. I didn't go to school. You didn't go to school. Like, that's kind of cool. Yeah. And then we, she should go to a good school then. Yeah. We should put her in like USC. Yeah. That makes sense. Blah, blah, blah. And it just sort of, it just sort of happened almost more for her, their sake, I think as some of the interviewers um, and the journalists kind of were saying, but it also goes back to what we were saying earlier. If none of these people seem to be having like a genuine conversation with their kids about like what they want to do or where they're going, they it definitely didn't get that. I didn't get that impression from Olivia Jade. That kid kind of was just like, hey, you're going to school. And because this is a school that like people know what it is, you're, this is where you're going kind of thing, as opposed to her being like, yeah, they really sat me down and were like, what do you want trying to do? Is this influencer thing? They were like, oh, hey, I really like this. So like, in order for me to keep doing this, they're making me go to school for like business or whatever. Like it's, and again, like they never address what these kids were going to school for, probably to protect their identity, which makes hundred percent sense, but they weren't going to school. Like they, they just didn't address that aspect of it. It was just like, we're going to slide you in through the water polo team. We're going to slide you in through the rowing team. Um, and then you just, as Singer said, you just don't show up and then you just go to school sort of thing. Um, well, he did have different tactics. And I think that's another interesting distinction between Felicity and Lori is that it was actually two different things that they did. And I think the other thing that I found interesting too, if you believe celebrity gossip, William H. Macy had no idea that Felicity Huffman did this. So I thought that was, that was a pretty juicy piece of gossip that had come out as well. Um, because then there was quite a bit of speculation about whether or not their marriage was going to be able to survive something like this. Uh, whereas, to your point, I think Lori, Loss Lori Laughlin and her husband were 100% in cahoots. Um, but I do think even that, you know, going back to my earlier point about the reenactments allowing you to make different judgments about what people had actually done and then how guilty that made them, you know, I, even I was a little bit torn of like, okay, which which really is worse? It's because... Felicity Huffman was um, prosecuted for essentially giving her daughter more time for the SAT, right? 
Whereas Lori Laughlin did the whole pose for the photo, you know, pretend we're going to fake that you're on this team. And so it's like, even between those two instances, I actually was wrestling with, with it a little bit because they're both terrible, right? Like, I, I actually am not sure which one is worse. I think that because the Olivia Jade and the sister example, like so directly led to an acceptance um, of a university, to me, it's somewhat worse. Uh, but the concept of like someone being able to just get more SAT time also is like really frustrating to me as well. So I don't know. I thought that was interesting too. Just kind of that, like there were different degrees, uh, of which these parents engaged with this guy and he almost had a range of services, right? Like it wasn't just one thing. It was a, it was a couple of different things that he could offer. Um, and you could kind of do all of them for the best chance. Uh, or you could kind of take your pick. <laughs> yeah, that's why I'm like, again, I don't... Is bribery illegal? Yes. Is this very clear, I'm going to just set this money on the table and we have an understanding, meaning, you know, we're going to give this to your like to your foundation. Like, again, I get it from like the illegal sort of legalities of it. The part that's just like amusing to me is like what you're talking about. And I think they were outlining it well when they were like, yeah, Singer would just like mark black or mark, mark Hispanic or mark Asian, depending on the school or like this extended time. And even when he's describing, he's like, oh yeah, you know, sometimes like kids have a learning disability because they just need extra time. And usually when you get extra time, you get like better, a better score. And like, I'm sitting there just kind of like, standardized testing is arbitrary to begin with and if kind of what he's getting at is just hey we're gonna get you an extra 20 minutes then it's like funny to me because it's like i don't almost see anything wrong with that even though he's doing something sort of like morally you know he's de he's using this uh, deception in order to like get that advantage but it is one of those things where if that's all you're doing kind of in the instance of um I'm definitely not familiar with Felicity Huffman's sort of circuit, but it's like, if she does that, if that's the only thing she sort of does just to kind of give her kids sort of a little bit more of a chance, at least it's not like you are doing something that's like uh, taking away, if you will, from something else to give to this thing. Like, it's not like, oh, okay, you know, especially the way that he structured it where it was just one kid in this room, which it seemed to be sort of the way that he did it, where it was sort of he'd have the proctor and then you'd have this one sort of person. It wasn't like this thing where, oh, okay, well, if it, if the class is shorter and you're affecting the 30 other people in the room, like it kind of was just this thing where it's like, oh, yeah, you're just getting this person extra time to think and then they get the score. And then there, it was just stuff like that that I was like, yeah, I mean, I get it. Like it's like we shouldn't be doing any of this. And then this is – Well, because know, I mean to me it's illegal though because she was able to improve her score yeah. as a result. Yeah, because this, this is like almost like the thing that you and I talk about all the time where I'm like, yeah, I mean I get – this minutia level but then kind of what we were a few minutes ago it's like but like what like why is this even a thing that's happening like it's like to zoom out and the stuff that we were talking about before about like this college even mapping out to sort of these careers like is all this deception and craziness even worth it in the end and that's the part you know that we began sort of the podcast with is i was like did this matter for any of these kids like it's like did or is that kind of just the point like it's like yeah this kid got went to harvard and especially some of his early clients like cool they went to harvard they're probably our age now maybe a little bit older is that i guess they got away with it maybe depending on again how far the paper trail and all that kind of stuff is and it's like does that what does that do and then kind of like if you follow even that to its logical conclusion say you're an employer and you find out one of your employees was involved uh, in this scandal, like they were the kid from 20 years ago, are you going to do anything about that? Like, do you, does all of a sudden their credentials not matter? And like, that's the piece that like, I've always been sort of a little intrigued by when I was working in uh, legal recruiting, they would definitely still look at your GPA when you were like 25 years out from legal. Like it was just down to the like, okay, like what's going to distinguish you between this person and this person, which was like eternally fascinating to me. Because you could just have been someone in that law class that's like, I don't even really want to be a lawyer. Like, I kind of am just doing this. And, like, that nonchalance will bite you 40 years later. And that's absurd to me. 
Yeah, I mean, that, that's absurd. And then, and, you know, not to like, again, to get too philosophical with it, but then zooming out from the system itself, it just gets more and more absurd, right? Because to your point, it's like standardized testing, we all know is hugely problematic for a number of reasons, right? And then you also see similar systems applied with grading and GPAs and things like that. And I think the larger question becomes like, is all of that stuff actually an accurate marker of a person's intelligence or the likelihood for them to be successful in life, right? Because who decided that these systems were going to be this way? I mean, I'm sure there's an answer to that. I don't have it. I'm sure there is a person that we can pinpoint decided each of these things and designed the SATs and designed GPAs and all of that. Yeah. So we will have to Google that after this and find out who that person was. But we've been using these systems now for so long that I think that's another interesting thing to look at is like, does this even really align anymore? Is it a proper metric to be using basically for a young person's entire academic trajectory, right? Like, are these the right things to be looking at that ultimately decide whether or not a student is a Harvard student or is a Yale student, right? And I think that's the thing that's kind of fascinating to me at this point. It's like how, you know, diverse was the thinking when we were setting up systems like this, right? And I think, you know, we already know that, right? Like standardized testing <clears throat> already, like you can see that I think in the data that, you know, white kids tend to do better on it for a number of reasons that are, again, like pointing towards problems that we have in our country from an educational standpoint. So I think like the system is rigged. And I also think that it doesn't reflect what is actually needed in our workforce today. And I think probably as a result, everyone is losing out, right? Not just students, not just individuals, but like employers are losing out because everything is kind of based on, to your point, 25 years later, I'm still looking at your GPA, right? And so I think like, it's not just the university system that is broken, it's this entire system of measuring a person's ability to be successful. Conversely, there's that little girl who joined Mensa because she has like 142 IQ. <laughs> but she was like, that's demonstrative <laughs> intelligence because she was basically like, I think they were saying she was like talking and reading at like 17 months or something absurd like that. Um, but to that point, maybe it, maybe the IQ test would be a better thing to be using. Yeah. Yeah. You I mean, know, I'm just saying, I don't know. I just like, to me, I just think, you know, we know that some kids are just better test takers. They're just better at studying. They're just, you know, that's not to say, like, I think it is an indication of intelligence a lot of times, for sure. You know, if you can get straight A's, I do think that says something about your intelligence. But I also think that some kids just have an easier time going through the structure that we've set up, and some don't. And I don't think that that necessarily means that that kid is less intelligent than the other. Like, I don't think that's definitive way of knowing that. Yeah, I agree. Because I mean, it's even when you think about like, oh, are you a Harvard person? Are you a Stanford person? Are you a this person? And really what that means is, do you think like the people who go here, and that's kind of where it should end. Like it shouldn't be like, oh, and then this president and then this person and this person, like it should kind of be like, cool, like in the same way that you might say, oh, well, I want to go to the state school because you know, they're very this way, like the vibe there is this um, versus sort of this other thing. So it is kind of, it is interesting to kind of see what I think will happen with the system. I think there definitely needs to be a reevaluation of just sort of how we standardize tests to begin with. I think one of the things that the documentary either said states explicitly or sort of alludes to is that um, in the same way that you have all these people who make far more money, um, telling you how you could be a marketer than actually marketing themselves and just kind of insert marketing for like any industry kind of thing. Uh, it does kind of say, hey, look at all these places, the Princeton Review and some of the other places that are basically uh, making whole industries, making money off of selling you prep for the standardized test. And so there's almost this hugely financial just black hole ecosystem similar to again the student loan kind of industry where it's just like all this money in education and is this actually 
enriching the lives of these students in a way that either a to your point maps them to a job that's actually like okay when you graduate this is guaranteed the level might not be guaranteed but like you're guaranteed to get a job or kind of like more where i'm at now with it is it's like are we enriching them meaningfully do they feel like they have a trade do they feel like I am leaving college with tangible skills, not just knowledge that I could probably do, you know, on my own if you're didactic or just sort of love to read or just love to learn sort of thing. But just like I actually have these tangible skills that I can now choose to apply in a variety of sort of scenarios and a variety of industries and a variety of sort of scale. Um, and I don't know that. Like it's kind of one of those where like I think until we have a serious conversation, you know, on the – political sort of standpoint of like what do we want future generations to know um what do we want them to even experience in a k through 12 sort of environment before they even get to sort of this university i just think that it's going to kind of continue the way it's been going and then you're kind of spiral out all the tangential issues of people who have anxiety and people who end up you know doing everything from Adderall to cocaine in college because they're just trying to like keep up with this and like working all these jobs and just sort of pay for school and just like the giant mess of it and I think there's this rite of passage that I think older generations look down on the younger generation and go well we made it through it so you can too and I think like that narrative is increasingly being uh, poked holes in because of you know when you look at inflation and stuff and you know our grandparents being like we bought a house for five grand and then we just laugh and then go that's what like rent is sort of thing like now it's just kind of like one of those things where it'll be interesting to see if there's ever any a true examination or a true shift in how the education system is outside of hey let's just forgive student loans hey let's just make it free because that doesn't really do anything it still keeps these universities well paid and not really being forced to compete in a way that might change things yeah, I mean, I think for me, I'm really hopeful for a shift into more like trade programming. And, you know, I also think that like the value of, of internships, you know, like I would love to see someone formalize a program or a trade program even where, you know, maybe instead of picking a major, you pick three different careers that you're interested in and then you get the opportunity, you know, in succession to go and actually try those out in the real world in some form, right? Even if it's at like the entry level version of that. I think that is the type of thing that could be more helpful for students in figuring out where they actually want to go. I, I know for myself, like I did internships in high school that I think were hugely illuminating. I went to my community's newspaper and asked them for an internship and they'd never done that before, but I got to write for the community's newspaper. And like, that was a really good peek into, okay, this was a small, small sliver maybe, but like, this is what life would be like as a journalist, you know? Um, and I had a fashion internship and it was the same thing. This is what it would be like to be a fashion buyer for a company like Nordstrom. Like, I think those experiences were very insightful in that you're actually doing kind of the practical side of the work. Um, and so I think that is something that I kind of hope that that we would consider as a country is like, yes, I think there needs to be an overhaul of the university system, but I think we also need to get a little bit more creative and event and inventive um, with the other types of programs that we might be able to come up with that do have a clear path into a career and also give young people an opportunity to find out what really is going to be a good fit for them. Right. And again, like, it's not to say that's going to be the career for the rest of your life, but I think even just from like a mental health perspective, you would be giving young people such a better start in life to know that they were able to kind of test drive some things. Right. And that's not the case right now. Right now you are essentially sinking a hundred thousand dollars plus, um, into something that you're stuck with. There is no test driving. You pick it and it's yours. You bought it, it's done, and you're going to be paying for it even after the fact. Yeah. Very true. Um, last thing before we start to uh, wind down here. You had mentioned guilt not too long ago, kind of uh, towards the start of the podcast here. Do you think these parents 
again, we didn't see any interviews, don't really have any much of a perspective except from a handful of the celebrities. Do you think they feel guilty about this? The presumption is that they definitely feel shame. You know, they're kind of embarrassed because, you know, now they have to show up to, you know, the uh, clubhouse, if you will, knowing that not only did you have doubt about your kid's ability to get into said school, but you also tried to uh, bribe their way in and failed publicly. Um, so shame is definitely present, but just do you think there's guilt, sort of regret, sort of any of that with these folks for, I would call it the action in a vacuum, not so much the bribery, which of which I don't really think anyone had kind of a major issue with, but just sort of the, you know, for, I guess call it the, is there any guilt with regards from a parent to child kind of a kind of context? Oh, yeah. I mean, look, I, I think that that's something we will truly never know, right? It's, it's you just have to make assumptions based on the information we have. So I think, you know, in the case of Lori Laughlin and her husband, I, I don't think that they feel very remorseful. I think they're just remorseful they got caught. And I think that that is very evident in how they responded when they were initially caught, right? Um, their biggest regret is being found out. I think if you are to believe, you know, the statement Felicity Huffman made at her sentencing, I think she's remorseful. I think she also has a lot of shame, um, but I think she's remorseful. I think she feels guilt. Uh, her daughter was completely in the dark, whereas I, I still do think Olivia Jade, even though publicly Olivia Jade said that she did not know, she still took those pictures. So unless she's a complete idiot, I think she knew her mother was up to something. Um, whereas Felicity Huffman's daughter had no idea that she was getting extra time. So I think that in that instance, um, to me at least, that shown through in Felicity Huffman's statement, the guilt that she felt around what she did to her daughter uh, and kind of the embarrassment that she caused for her by doing something behind her back. I think that's probably a very tough thing for any mother to experience. Um, and I think with the other parents, it's probably a range. You know, I think there was... The one reenactment um, with the the couple, um, I can't remember their names, but it was towards the end of the documentary. Yeah, and you could tell they weren't remorseful either. You know, they were game planning uh, essentially what was about to come. You know, they knew that this was all about to crumble, and I think the wiretaps showed that. Right, like they were they were basically trying to prep for you know their criminal behavior being leaked. And so I think a lot of those conversations that we saw showed to me that they didn't feel any sort of guilt or remorse. I think, again, in the case of Lori Laughlin, their guilt or remorse was purely around being found out. Um, so, you know, it's tough to say. I think it was probably a little bit of, of both in looking at the collective group of people that were prosecuted. Um, and, uh, you know, <laughs> I am definitely more sympathetic to the ones that actually seem to fully comprehend the extent of what they did. Yeah, I definitely would want to know um, the dynamic between those parents and kids after all of this fallout, because I feel like that's a, it's like a layer of trust that I don't know you can get back because it's not like, you know, in an extreme example, you're a kid that ends up with an addiction, like an alcoholic addiction or something like that. And then you're kind of, you, you, you're trying to get it together. And then your parents just always look at you as like, you know, you're the addict kind of thing. This is a, your parents just don't think you're smart enough kind of thing. And like, that's like, I feel like that would just cut deep and like the long tail of that especially for some of these people. Like for like Olivia Jade, it's kind of, I feel like for her, it'll sort of be, uh, again, kind of exactly uh, what you were saying. From her per public persona, this is gonna, this is just a non-issue. Like it's kind of like a, oh, whatever, that kind of sucks that like, you know, I'm kind of being in the spotlight for this and I lost my sponsors and blah, 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 whatever. Like I'll probably bounce back kind of thing. But like, again, if you're just these normal kids, you know, quote unquote, just the kid of a financer, kid of a lawyer, kid of a blah, 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 and then like this blows up and it's just like a, wow, I thought I got into school kind of thing. And like, I guess I didn't. And like, where would I be now? It's almost like this existential crisis. Like you're, you're like, you're like, if you want to talk about imposter syndrome and sort of all that, like 
this is a case where it's almost true. Like it's like, it's almost legitimately true that like you shouldn't be there kind of thing or you don't know, you just have no idea. It's not like, oh, I was on the wait list and then, oh, you got in. It's like, a, oh, you just fundamentally were just kind of the the chance to fail, if you will, or was taken from you because your parents didn't think that you were smart enough. And it's just like, I think that that's like a wild thing. And it's like, I would want to, the the sort of part of me that, you know, turns your head to watch like a house fire or sort of something like that uh, wants that version of a documentary or sort of a follow-up to kind of just be like, you know, it's five years from now, this kid's hopefully kind of landed on their feet, just like what's your relationship with the parents. But at the same time, I just think it's going to be an extremely difficult thing that they're going to be. Some of these kids will just be forever mentally and psychologically just scarred by just like that revelation of, especially finding out in the news, like some of these people did and just kind of be like, Oh wow. Like that's, my dad that's my mom walking into that courthouse wait what's going on and then family calling you and yada yada and just having that whole thing that whole thing spiral well i it's not just that it's not just the false admission that i think is is so tough i think to me one of the most cringeworthy and painful moments of the documentary is there is a girl out there that knows that her mother thinks that she is dumber than her sister. Yeah. Like that didn't even have anything to do with the admissions. Like some of those conversations, I thought like watching that, that scene in particular, I really, really felt for that girl and for the mother. I think that, you know, the reality is I've always been fascinated a little bit by this topic. And I think that there's actually a couple of um, scripted shows that have had some interesting lines and sort of explored this theme a little bit of, you know, whether parents love one child more than the other. And I think that that concept extends as well to the fact that parents probably also have an honest judgment of which child is more intelligent, but that doesn't mean you ever want them to know that. Right. And I think that to your point, that is truly what I think is going to scar some of these kids, right? It's not just knowing that they got into a university um, and they shouldn't be there. It's these really personal elements and conversations that revealed things that they probably should have never known that their parents thought about them, right? And I think that that was hard for me to watch, to hear that mother say, oh, you know, <laughs> she'll know something's up. <laughs> She's not like my other daughter. Like, ugh. I nightmare for that family. I think that will be a, a very tough situation to get over. And all of it came crumbling down because of unrelated things. I think that's the thing that's, uh, that's most amusing because as, as open about what he was doing, call it that as singer was, uh, it was just tangential stuff that ended up causing this entire scandal to, uh, to be publicly known. I feel like that's how so many of like these stories are though, right? And especially some of the best ones are it, it's where it wasn't for any particular reason. It was a f right, but it was all kind of found out. Um, to be honest, I enjoy those the most because to me, it always sort of reinforces why it doesn't pay to be a criminal. <laughs> like, I, I think that we need stories like this that kind of reinforce for society, you will be found out at some point in the strangest way, in the weirdest way. Um, but, you know, we all kind of have to meet our maker at the end of the day. <laughs> Any final thoughts? Anything that we uh, missed that you want to uh, toss on to this educational financial fire scandal? I would definitely um, recommend this one. I think um, I think it will be interesting for most people. I think it will be particularly interesting, obviously, for parents and school-aged kids, obviously, um, or really anyone that, you know, has gone to university in the last 10 years and understands kind of how selective it's been or has been a part of that process themselves. Um, but I also think, you know, even if you just, like, True crime. I think you'll enjoy this. Uh, and I think that, you know, again, not a fan usually of reenactments, but this was a, a particularly good use of them. Um, so I think just the, the storytelling as well was well done. I think something people will enjoy. So thumbs up for me. Yeah, I'd, uh, I'd recommend it as well. I think um, it's a good look at that scandal, uh, and hopefully you will have a conversation much like this one with folks that you know just about education in general and kind of how we've gotten to a place that 
uh, basically you could call it created someone like Singer um, and sort of the ability that he has to do this, the fact that it seemed like an entrepreneurial idea to him because you could either do something smaller, which was not a guarantee, or you could do something major, like 10 million, 15 million, 20 million dollar donation, and that was not a guarantee. And he had basically just figured out a way to like, hey, I know who the gatekeepers are. I can kind of slip something to them and we can kind of just make this work. Uh, why is our education system um, like that? Uh, just again, kind of the stuff that we talked about this evening. Um, but yeah, check that out. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, my fellow feathers in arms, that is episode number five. As we mentioned up top, if you enjoyed what you heard, help us keep it going by supporting us over at patreon.com slash Pandora's Quack and becoming a Patreon. Feel free to share, rate, and review us on the free podcasting service of your choice and stick around for Pandora's Quack's other upcoming shows. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, listeners. This podcast is produced by Pandora's Quack. She's Nicole Matthews, uh, and you can follow her where? At Twitter, at, at Nicole Matthews, and on Instagram, at Marie Coley. And I'm Brandon Jones. You can follow me at Lamar Diablo on Twitter. Uh, but the best way to reach me will likely be on our Discord. Dot, dot, dot. Um, for next week, listeners, Foreman's Matthews, question for you. Why is it American culture, do you think, or is it human nature, that when we are rooting for a hero... We refuse to recognize the red flags. <laughs> oh, definitely human nature. I think there's been examples of that dating back to the beginning of time. Very interesting. Very interesting. There is your teaser, ladies and gentlemen. And these are the rabbit holes that quack. Mm-hmm.